As usual folks, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, has dropped another economic bombshell on us. This time, it's their updated world economic outlook, you know, the one we're all supposed to take seriously because it's full of growth projections, dire warnings, and a lot of finger-pointing at why the global economy is tripping over itself like a kid trying to run up an escalator going down. Now, the IMF has trimmed its global growth forecast for next year to 3.2%, down from the laughable 3.3% they gave us just a few months ago in July. What's important here isn't the trimming, it's that we've been slogging through this mediocre growth for years. They've been harping on about it, talking about what they call the new mediocre. Well, guess what, it feels less like a new mediocre and more like the new normal, and not in a good way. But the elephant in the room isn't just the lame growth forecast. No, no, it's the IMF standing up and patting central banks on the back for taming inflation without triggering recessions. Yeah, so central banks have hit their soft landing. Successful, right? Well, not so fast. So let's peel back the layers here. Sure, inflation is slated to slow to 4.3% in 2025, down from 5.8% this year, and the IMF is giving itself a standing ovation for this. But this isn't a victory lap, it's more like kicking the recession can down the road. Yes, the Fed and the ECB get to claim a win in the near term by squeezing inflation without sparking an outright recession. But what they're effectively doing is shifting the pain forward, and that pain is setting up a time bomb. You see, the reason they managed to avoid spiraling inflation, for now, is because they've been slamming consumers with interest rate hikes and don't forget those big boys, the corporate sector, whose debt costs are piling up. They didn't crush demand outright, which is impressive, but they've suppressed future demand growth. Central banks may have dodged full-blown recessions for now, but in doing so, they've created staggering debt hangovers, which brings us to a critical issue, global public debt. $100 trillion. Let that sink in for a second, $100 trillion, or 93% of the global GDP, will be global public debt by the end of 2024. That's not just a number, it's a ticking geopolitical liability. You know the two biggest culprits, the United States and China. We're dealing with unsustainable debt primarily driven by demand for increased social support, aging populations, another ticking time bomb, and, of course, the huge costs of the ongoing transition to clean energy which seems to be the economic equivalent of sprinting through quicksand. And as this public debt continues to skyrocket, so do the long-term risks to financial stability. Downside risks are no longer just looming on the horizon, they're casting shadows right over our heads, and the consequences for public finance are far from trivial. Moving on to trade, and oh man, this one irritates us all. If you thought that trade war rhetoric died after 2020, buckle up. We're all feeling the pinch of growing protectionism, the policy mistake du jour resurfacing across major global economies. The IMF is warning us about the rise of protectionist policies, and it doesn't take a genius to understand where this is heading. By building walls instead of bridges, countries are only digging their graves deeper. Tariffs and other trade restrictions are back in vogue, not just between the US and China, but among other major economies, too. Donald Trump is out there shouting once again about a 60% tariff on Chinese imports and a 10% tariff on everything else. Yeah, the populists want to spark inflation all over again, it's like these trade barriers are gas being thrown onto a smoldering fire by people who don't seem to care about the consequences. The IMF's own chief economist, Pierre-Olivier Garinches, calls it clearly, if things keep going south, we're looking at a 0.5% drop in global GDP by 2026. Now, half a percent doesn't sound scary in isolation, but it translates to billions of dollars just evaporating from the world's collective output and that's before we factor in the employment and supply outcome cracks that will undoubtedly widen from all this trade nonsense. Now, we can't talk about global economics without looking at China. The IMF has cut China's growth forecast for this year from 5% to 4.8%. This may seem slight, but when you're talking about the world's second largest economy, the differences can have resounding ripple effects globally. The ground truth is simple, China's property sector is still in serious trouble, consumer sentiment is low, and more importantly, their growth model that relied so heavily on housing market exuberance is flying apart at the seams. But what does the IMF say? Oh, just the usual, China's People's Bank has taken good steps to guide the economy in the right direction. 
right direction? Yeah, sure, if that direction includes a looming real estate collapse and low consumer confidence. Let's face it, the IMF is just hoping and praying that throwing a couple band-aids on the situation will hold the dam long enough to prevent a full-on global financial shockwave. Their 4.5% forecast for 2025 sounds like it's been plucked from the same optimism tree they were snacking on back in 2008, right before the world caved in. And speaking of economic shockwaves, here's a little thing they almost glossed over in the report, climate change and its effect on food and energy prices. Oh, and let's not forget geopolitical tensions. The war in Ukraine. The Israel-Hamas conflict. Who's paying for all this? Us, eventually. The food crises that accompany these conflicts are fast escalating, driving commodity prices up, especially in regions that can least afford it. And let me ask you this, dear viewers, when those food and energy prices spike again, we're looking at about 1.5 to 2% annual contributions to inflation through 2025, how long do you think those hard-won deflationary trends will last, huh? The answer is not long. The IMF admits so themselves. The kicker. The IMF estimates about 70 to $100 billion in climate adaptation costs, especially in poorer nations, by 2030. Yeah, lofty goals that nobody has any real plan to fund. And don't even get me started on these illogical thought bubbles floating around about climate reparations. In an already strained economic environment with trillions in debt, where exactly is this money supposed to come from? Here's where it gets fun, folks. It's not actually about fixing the problem, is it? It's never about real solutions for the economic elites. Instead of meaningful adjustments, the ruling class and by extension, their enforcers in the IMF are much more interested in managing narratives while moving money around to keep the house of cards from collapsing on their heads. The good old debt treadmill routine, rinse and repeat. They shrug off real change in favor of endless monetary tweaking and mildly hopeful projections. Trade wars. Climate change. Trillion dollar debts. Geopolitical chaos. No problem, let's pump a few liquidity measures into the system and trim our growth projections by 0.1% every quarter until people stop paying attention. So where's this all going? Well, according to the IMF's beautifully revised and toned down version of reality, the global economy will stay in mediocre purgatory, a lukewarm growth rate scenario where discontent festers, social unrest increases, and inequality grows further. The attempts to plug every bleeding gap with debt-driven radar tweaks from central banks will only delicate balance for so long. With protectionism rising, wage stagnation permeating middle classes across the developed world, and crushing public debts suffocating any real reform or investment, we're hurtling toward a deeper systematic crack. And you know what? At this point, reckless debt-fueled boom and bust cycles are baked into the cake. It's all about which bubble pops first whether it's sovereign debt implosions, an inflation spike, or the next geopolitical domino to fall. 